without him. Amen. Thank you, oh, amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Come on, praise him one more time. <laughs> Father, now I ask your blessings upon your word now in his weeds. Open the words of life and ask your strength and your anointing, Lord, that we would say that and only that which you would have us to say. Pray that every heart will be open and prepared to receive your word. Lord, anoint us now. Come against every hindrance and distraction. Lord, if you'll bless us, we will be blessed. This is our prayer. In the name of Jesus, we pray and ask it all. Amen and amen. Please be seated in his presence. Amen. In the recent uh, weeks and uh, few months, my wife and I have had the uh, so it's start to say opportunity, but not that we were looking for it. Had the responsibility of traveling quite a bit, and uh, which means that we have been away from you quite a bit. And one of the things that has uh, been noted of late that each time that we return home um, and back to this place um, look like there's some more good news. <laughs> and uh, what a joy that is. A, a man to come home to good news and uh, we've heard of how you have uh, been caring for each other, ministering to one another, going into the prisons, as we've heard, the nursing homes, uh, fulfilling the ministry, uh, doing outreach events, and continuing in prayer, preaching and teaching the word of God, all of which are in my estimation, is are marks of a, of a good church, a healthy church. Amen. Oh, amen. Y'all, amen. How, how many of you believe you're in a good church? Amen. 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 Interesting what, um, how, uh, what, the dynamics of a church is, is, is comprised in. We started a couple of Sundays ago talking about our life flow. The life flow of this church. What is it that drives it? Why do people come here? What is all the exuberance and the joy about? Is it just emotion? Does people come week after week to get an emotional high? Is it all about just uh, coming and having our, 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 our felt need met? Uh, noted that uh, I think it was John MacArthur over 30 years ago had a book in which he described the anatomy of the church and he presented uh, an analogy borrowed from the Apostle Paul where uh, the church is uh, seen in four features, uh, bones and, or skeletons if you will internal systems, muscles, and tissues, you know, which are all components of a body. Uh, the, 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 the church is called the many things. It's called the bride of Christ. And, uh, amen. It's called, uh, styled as many things. But perhaps the, the description that best describes it is it's a, it is a body. It's more than an organization, though it requires organization. It's an organism. It is a body that is alive in what we see here today. And the thing that has been driving and motivating and continuing to push us forward is the fact that this is an organism. This is the body of Christ. This is not, this is not a club, not a sorority. Oh, amen. Amen. Not, not just a community of people that uh, are built around you know, just some common calls that uh, have kept us motivated over all of the years. The truth of the matter is, is that it indeed is the body of Christ. 
Oh, amen. And we know that a body is made up of these components, uh, again, bones, and, um, which, which represents the structure. And how many of you know that if a church is alive, if it's going to survive, it has to have structure? It, it has to have a, some form to it that will hold it together. And over the years, we have tried to lay that foundation, the form being uh, that uh, I believe the church... Uh, needs to be built on a high view of God. The fact that we know that there's a God that we serve. We're not serving, we're not here singing to, celebrating some entity, a power that does not exist. We really believe that there's a living God who is worthy of all of our praise. That's why we can come in here week after week and even sometime through our own disappointments and still lift our hands and praise him and give him glory. Not only that, we believe that the authority of the word of God, we're not here preaching philosophy. We're not here preaching and declaring our own ideas. But there is a truth that has been, uh, my God, preserved by God himself a uh, long time before you and I ever got here, that is the word of God. We believe in the absolute authority of scripture. Amen. 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 It would be ludicrous for us to come week after week after week to hear the opinions of a man. Amen. 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 If we came here week after week just to hear what the pastor has to say or to have me present whatever ideas that I may have, then not only is it ludicrous for me, it's, it's ludicrous for you to come here and listen. Oh, amen. amen. But we are not here based on our own thoughts and ideas. There, we believe that the Bible of, is the word of God, and it is, that is the foundation on which we stand. Amen. It is the pillar and ground of truth. It's what we hold up. It, it's what we stand on. Amen. amen. Hallelujah. So thank God for the form. But how many of you know there's a lot of churches that may have form, they may have structure, but then they, they're still dead. Because if there is, how many of you know in order, uh, we need more than just a form. We got to have life in it. And life has to be more than uh, enthusiasm. Life has to be those internal systems, just like my body has to have internal systems. Amen. Uh, blood and cells. and uh, There's a whole cellular world that operates internally to bring life and mobility to the bone and the muscles and the tissue and the flesh to make it stand up, to prop it up, to bring life to it. Do I have a witness? And so it is in the church. I do not want to be a part of a dead church. I refuse to be a part of a dead church. I refuse to be a part of a church that has no life. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. We work too hard, serve too long, give too much, deal with too much, than to be a part of something that's dead, that has no life in it, is not going anywhere. Thank you, Jesus. But oh, when the life flows, somebody say life flow. When the life is flowing through the church of the living God, it doesn't have to be a mega church. It's not based on the size of its buildings, the size of its budget. That's not the issue. It's not even measured by its programs and all the external things that people tend to judge churches according. Because we can have all of the programs in place, we can have all of the money, we can have all of the lofty buildings, but if there's no life in it, if God is in it, hallelujah, then, then people's lives still does, does not change. And amen, amen, hallelujah, glory to God, glory to God. But how many of you know, how many of you thank God for the life flow? As pastor of this church, I can say of a truth, the thing that I desire more than anything. There's one thing I desire for this church, and that is, is for us to be the church 
that Christ is calling us to be. I don't want to be that. I, you know, listen, our goal is not to mimic any other church, to compete. It's not our goal to, to, to you know, present or, or, or have anyone look or think of us in any kind of certain way. That's really not what it's about. How many of you know it's not about pressing people, impressing communities, or to have anyone speak or think well of us? If, 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 if I, if we can just hear our Lord and Savior at the end of the day say, well done. Well done. I, I, I read the story of a, of, a, of, a, of a professional violinist who had the privilege of performing at a concert and at the end of his performance immediately the crowd all stood and applauded they applauded him and, and he stood there with tears in his eyes obviously the, you know weeping and disturbed and one of the Stageman came to him and said, what's, what's wrong? Why are you weeping? Don't you see they love you? Don't you see everybody standing and applauding you? But he responded, but, but everybody didn't stand. There's one man in the middle sitting. You see that man sitting in the middle? He's not standing. What? You mean there's 2,000 people standing and applauding you and you worry about one man that's not? Get your mind off of that one man. Celebrate the fact you ought to be happy that there's 2,000 people that are applauding you and celebrating you. They said, well, no, 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 no. But the one man in the middle is my father and he's my teacher. And if he's not pleased with my performance... It don't matter who else celebrates me. If he's not pleased. If the one that called us is not pleased. If the whole world writes stories and give us accolades. If our father is not pleased. God, I will, yeah, I just want to hear him say, well done. Hey, God Almighty. If we can just hear him say, well done. And here's what I hear the Lord say. It's not always the stuff that people see that pleases me. Almighty. It's not always your performances that pleases me. But what pleases me is your attitudes. It's, it's proper spiritual attitudes. It's not platitudes. It's attitude. That's what I'm concerned about. Oh, amen. Last Sunday, uh, two Sundays ago, we start talking about proper spiritual attitudes. And we set forth, first and foremost, there has to be an attitude of obedience. Somebody say obedience. Obedience. Obedience to God. Obedience to the word of God. That's God saying, you know what? I don't want you to be a church, you know, with a whole lot of stuff and a whole lot of, you know, activity that is going on. But then when you hear the word of God, we, we, we don't respond to it. I want to ask you, are we obedient to the word of God? Does it really change our life when we hear the message week after week after week? Obedience is a must have of all attitudes. We, 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 we have to have come to a place where we understand that our coming to the Lord's house 
means that whatever God says, if I can, if I can, if I know and believe that this is the word of God, and I am confronted with his truth, then when, 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 when I'm confronted with the word of God, I don't make excuses for my behavior. I don't excuse myself and I don't, I don't just tolerate sin and justify my actions. It means that if God says it, I agree with God. And I align myself with him. I don't just do more. There are those who act as though, listen, instead of obeying, they just do more stuff. And the Lord says in 1 Samuel 15, 22, remember, he says, does the Lord have as great delight in sacrifices and, as he do in He said, no, to obey is better. It's better. It's better. In sacrifice, the Lord says it's better to obey, to hearken is better than the fat of rain. Listen, listening to God is better than any offering that you can ever give to God. You can come and you can give millions of dollars, but if you are if you are disobedient to the word of God, God says it's better to do what I tell you to do. Are you listening? That first attitude is an attitude of obedience, and then we declared humility you see if you obey God his word then it's easy to humble ourselves it's a virtue that's part of the character of God humility God is not an arrogant God Psalms 113 and 5 keep going David he says he says he says who is like unto the Lord who dwelleth on high is there any power like God? Is there any man that can be even declared to be even compared to God? Who is likened unto our God? And then it says in verse 6, who humbleth himself. Behold, he humbled himself to behold the things that are in heaven and in earth. God is so lofty, but yet he humbled himself. To behold the things that are in heaven and earth. God got to humble himself just to behold what's in heaven and in earth. God has to humble himself to even see you. To deal with you. To come and get involved with your situation. For God to care, see, and involve himself with your situation. He has to humble him because he's so, God is so lofty. His ways are so high above ourselves. But yet he humbled himself. We saw a couple of weeks ago concerning our Lord Jesus humbled himself. He said he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Made himself of no reputation. Jesus was God and yet he humbled himself in human flesh. Died the lowest death. Gave up his life for you and I. And then even Paul says, let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. God humbled himself. Jesus humbled himself. The apostles humbled themselves. Jude, the brother of James. I love it in Jude where he says, he wrote, he wrote, he opens the book and he says, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ. Literally, he was the half-brother of Jesus. He was Jesus. They had the same mama. Yeah, fleshly mother. They had the same fleshly mother. But when he writes in his letter, he don't say, hey, uh, I'm Jude writing. I'm Jesus' brother. He didn't, he didn't do like some of us was doing. See, if we were Jesus' brother, we'd have done some name dropping. I need y'all to listen to me because I am Jesus' brother. So hear what I'm about to say. No, 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 no. He said, no, I'm Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ. That's all I want to be known as. I'm not trying to be nobody. I'm not trying to be all of that in a bag of chips. I, I just want to be known. It's an honor for me. To be a servant of Jesus Christ. How many of you know that's a spiritual attitude? What would happen in the church? What would happen in the church if we all had an attitude of obedience? Where we heard, when, when we hear the word of God, we don't, we don't even get offended by saying, you know what? I don't want to be, you know, I, you know, what's wrong with the people going down there doing what that preacher say? No, it's not about that preacher. 
It's about the Word of God. Where we, number one, we have an obedient spirit to the Word of God. Secondly, we humble ourselves because if we obey God, it's easy to be humble. And then we talk about unity. We got to be on one accord. How many of you know there are no big eyes and little U's in the house of God? If you want a church that's alive, that has the life flow of God flowing in through it, let there be a church where, oh my God, that everybody understand, amen, amen, that God wants us to be one. And we've got to endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit. You know, that's what, that's what, that's what Paul said, I believe it's Ephesians 4, 3. He says, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit you see if you have the spirit of God then you have no difficulty being unified with your brothers and your sisters you understand real quickly it's not about me but it is about the spirit of God and I want to submit this that anytime that you're engaged in divisiveness division click you are diametrically opposing the spirit of God Come on, because that's what the Spirit of God produced. But not only are you diametrically opposing the Spirit of God, but you are on the wrong side of Jesus' prayer. For he prayed in John 17, he says, Father, I pray that they might be one. And any time you get engaged in any kind of conflict that anything other than oneness, you are on the wrong side of Jesus' prayer. And that's the wrong place to be. Come on, somebody, you so, you so, come on, you, you so determined to have your right in your own individuality, individuality sometime, but then you're not thinking about the fact that this is what the Spirit produces, this is what Jesus has prayed for, and therefore, if I have the Spirit of God and the life flow of God, then I'm going to be engaged in unity. Now, those, 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 that's, that's a quick, quick review of what we had a couple of weeks ago. I want to lift up three other attitudes that the time would allow today. And I hope not to be long. There's three other spiritual attitudes that I believe that I want to submit to us that if the life flow of God, if we're going to be that church, that church, that place, that body, that God is pleased with, there's some non-negotiable. And I want, I want to submit this, and if you ever, and write this down, um, Willingness to serve. Come on, say that with me. Willingness to serve. Say it with me one more time. Willingness to serve. Amen. Wait, 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 Pastor. Now, what that got to do with me being saved? I just want to join the church. I just want to come to church. And I want, uh, when I come to church, I'm not coming to serve. I'm coming for you all to serve me. Preach to me, sing to me, counsel me, help me, support me, marry me, bury me. Come on. Christmas, my baby. Go to the hospital and visit my auntie cousin. <laughs> but don't ask me to serve. Amen. What would happen if everybody had that attitude in the church? It matters not the buildings, the structure, whatever. It eventually will die if there didn't exist in it this attitude and willingness to serve. And, and serving, we must understand, is not necessarily related to the programs of the church because not everybody can sing in the choir and not everybody in the choir can sing. I just, <laughs> Pastor... Pastor, you just messed up. And I love all of these precious That just kind of came out. Because that wasn't in my notes. That wasn't even in my spirit. <laughs> it just flowed. Amen. Somebody say life flowed. Amen. No, I'm just, I'm, I'm actually just kidding. Y'all, y'all still with me. You're woke. Amen. You're woke. But, but, but what's the point, Pastor? It's this. It's not the programs, because not everybody will be in the choir. Not everyone will sing or serve on the usher board. Not everybody will be engaged in the deacon ministry and outreach ministry, whatever. But everybody, listen, listen, listen. Everybody who is a part of the body of Christ, God has given you a ministry. 
and something that you are supposed to be doing. Amen. In the service of the Lord. Amen. Now, first we need to properly identify ourselves. Would you go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 4 and verse 1 and 2? I want to try to breeze through a few verses here. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. What, what does Paul say there? Let a man so account of us. First of all, if we're going to serve the Lord, we got to have the, the proper mind and attitude about it. We got to understand ourselves what serving is about. And, and, and then, so he says, here's what Paul writes. He says, I don't want you to think of me as some big, great apostle or preacher or whatever. He says, let a man so account of us. Here's how I want you to think of us. He's talking about himself and the other apostles. How? As of the ministers of Christ. As of the ministers of Christ. Another word can be used there as of the servants of Christ. That's how I want you to think of us, as servants of Christ. Because it's not about position or title or even particular giftedness. I am called, I've, I've, for, for, since the start of this church, I've been the pastor of the church. I'm, I'm, I'm one of the teachers here. Uh, I'm, I'm the senior pastor, leader, whatever. But, 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 but it does not really matter what my title or giftedness may be. It, I'm still a servant of Jesus Christ, and I never outgrow that. And it really doesn't matter what the gift in this, the role, or the title. We are all ministers of Jesus Christ. And so in the church, we can never afford to have this attitude where this role or this job are the significant key important roles. And then these little menial tasks over here that are behind the scenes that no one sees are necessary or insignificant in the church of God. Because the truth of the matter, Paul said, let a man so count of us as a minister of God. What? And stewards of the mysteries of God. Stewards of the mysteries of what? Of God. Of, of God. Read on. I, I, I'm not going to really try to teach this and give it proper due, but I want to work. Move, move quickly. Moreover, it is required in stewards. Listen, it is required. It is required. What is it that God's required? Does he require everybody to have a PhD? Does he require that everyone be able to articulate the scripture and roll it out and, and everybody to be able to sing whatever? No. It is required, though. What? That a man be found faithful. God says, all I require is that you be faithful. Faithful. I don't require that you be gifted, talented, articulate, charismatic. He says, but it is required that stewards, that servants, that ministers be found faithful. faithful. Somebody say faithful. faithful. You got to be faithful. You just got to be faithful. You just got to be faithful to whatever call and responsibility that you've been given because that's what he required. Yeah. It's not the applause of people, but it's the one who, 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 who really, to, the, to whom we have to do that we ought to be pleasing. He says, he says, required this dude to be found faithful. Yes. Amen. But with me, it is a very small thing. Now, but, now, 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 here, here are, are you in verse three? Yes. He says, what with me? Now, now, this is where people get messed up. Because they worry about other people's opinion too much. Oh, I just said something. The thing that keeps other people from serving and, 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 and cause some who are serving to get lofty and caught up in themselves because they're looking at other folks and worrying about what they think. But you know what? How many of you know it's not what other people think that really matters? Here's what Paul said. It is what? With me, it is a very small thing. Yes. That I should be judged of you. Paul said, I'm not really worrying about what you think about me. Amen. What if we all can get there? Yeah. Say, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not really worried about how you think I'm doing what I do. Because if I do what I do to the glory of God. And I faithfully do that. I'm not worried about whether you think it's well. Because last time I checked, you don't have the keys. No, it's, it's, that, it's, that, it's, that, it's that man in the middle. It's that one, my father who called me. He, he the, he's the one. And oh, what would happen in the church if we can quit worrying about other people's opinion? 
and how they think we do and how we you know think we don't. Amen. R read on. It's a very small thing that I should be judged of you. You say it's a small thing. It's a small thing. Or of man's it, judgment. Does it sound like the Apostle Paul got a little attitude here? <laughs> It sounds like he was like, you know what, I ain't studying y'all. You know, if some of us was writing this, if we were writing, we wouldn't say, you know how gracefully he says, it's a small thing that I be what? Judged, judged of you. you. Come on, let me translate to us, to Ebonics. It says, I ain't studying y'all. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't studying you. I ain't thinking about you. Amen? But what? Or of man's judgment. Or of man's judgment, because I understand it's really not man's judgment that really ultimately matters. But what? Yea, I judge not mine own self. He says, he says, listen, listen, not only, and, and don't miss this, he says, not only is it a small thing for me to be judged of other people, but I don't even judge my own self. He says, I'm not even caught up in my own opinion of how well I do. Because the truth be told, there's some folks get stuck on themselves and they think they can sing or think they can preach or think they can whatever and they get lifted up in their head swollen because they feel like you know what I really got it going on I'm all deep and anointed and, and, and God look at how God's using me and I'm really being effective for the kingdom of God and all of this stuff and you know what Paul said you know what it doesn't matter how successful I may appear to be and I look back at all the things that I think that I have done. He said, but you know what? Even my own judgment of myself, I don't trust. Because my own judgment of me is skewed. What, what? For I know nothing by myself. Listen, I don't even know. I, what, what a statement. To be able to say, I don't know nothing I've done wrong. I don't know anything. I haven't mistreated anybody. I have not done anything wrong knowingly, but I still don't trust it. Yes. For what? Yet am I not hereby justified. He says, even though I know I have not intentionally wronged anybody, but I'm still not justified. What? But he that judges me is the Lord. But the one that judges me is the Lord. He's the one I got to please. Because, see, sometimes I can do the right thing, what I think, you know, might have the right motive. But sometimes, uh, underneath all of that, may be a little pride interwoven. Yeah. Amen. So, so, he that judges me is the Lord. And then what? Therefore, judge nothing. Here's what Paul says. If any, anything you take away from the day, here's what is some advice to the church. He said, therefore, judge nothing. What? Before the time. Before the time. In other words, all of these people that you put on a pedestal, don't put them on a pedestal so fast. And not only that, but all these people that you're trying to send to hell, don't send them to hell so fast. He said, don't judge nothing before the time because sometimes the ones we have exalted may be the one that miss God. The one we think is nothing and nobody and God ain't using and not anointed might be the one that God, when it's all said and done, come on, that he gives a crown of glory. Oh, I, I, oh my, I just said something. I just said something. Come on now. Sometime when we call some people's name, we say, oh, he's anointed or she's anointed. Don't, don't judge it before the time. Amen, somebody. In fact, you say don't judge nothing. Before. Well, in fact, why don't we just leave all the judgment to God anyway? We're worried about who's right and who's wrong. And let's, 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 let's be engaged with serving the Lord ourselves and striving to do everything we can do to please him. Oh, amen. So when it's all said and done, we can simply hear God say, well done, good and faithful servant. Don't judge nothing and nobody before the time. Oh, my God. That is so liberating. That is so liberating. Because I ain't got to figure out who's right and who's wrong. Come on, who's going to be saved and who's going to be lost. He didn't leave it up to me to figure it out. He said, don't judge nothing before the time. That means I can celebrate you. I pray and trust God that you are serving him with all of your heart, with a pure heart. But listen, that's not for me to determine. 
Glory to God. Amen. So he says, just, just nothing before them. Pastor, where are you going with this? Amen. We've got to have a willingness to serve. Somebody say again, a willingness to serve. And something about serving, we got to understand that, that, that we are all different. All different. You got a set of keys? You got your keys? Amen. Um, all, all of us have a key ring, and on each ring, that there's, there's generally some keys that look alike, but every one of them is cut different. Anybody, anybody got four keys on your ring that is exactly alike? Anybody? You, you, amen. They, they say four keys to the same lock? No. Okay. We, 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 we might all have four keys made by, what's, what's the key company? Key, what is it? What's, slave made, yeah. We may have four keys that the body of it look alike, but I would say most times, every one of those keys are cut different. They're cut different because they can unlock different doors. I don't have room on a ring to be having five keys just the light. That's too much weight in my pocket. I, I need every key to unlock the door that it's designated to unlock. Amen. And, and, and where are you going with this, Pastor? God has, has caused every one of us in his kingdom to be able to unlock some door. I'm just glad that I am a key on the ring. But I understand something. As much as I study, as much as I pray, as committed as I may be, I cannot unlock every door. Amen. There's some doors that Ella Patrick got to unlock. And there's some doors that Ella Shell got to unlock. There's some doors that Corn and, 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 and Brother Hutchison and, and Devin and Tanya and all of us got to unlock. But what we got to understand that we got to be engaged and willing for God to use us to serve wherever and however he wants us to. Because just as sure as we just sit up like a key on a ring. I declare there's some doors that are not being unlocked. There's some lives that is not being ministered to. Some purposes that are not being fulfilled. And one of the things that people get lost in is that when the church grows and people look around and then the first thing the devil will say, they don't need me. They already got enough ministers. They already got enough deacons. They already got enough people in the band and in the choir on the lush ball. They don't need me. But if God saved you, he cut you in a certain way. He cut you in a way. Amen. When, I was, when the Lord, I was in my office studying, I was thinking about my buddy there, Brother James. I said, he cut him in a way. That there's some doors that's got to be unlocked that the pastor can't do. And I began to think about different ones in this body and how God has uniquely brought us here together. And as we continue to grow and as we continue to move, every one of us that God brings in this house, he says, he says, I have uniquely shaped your life where there's something that's got to be done that only you can do. But he wants you to be willing to serve and to be used by him. And he has not called you to be like nobody else. My question is, are you willing? Are you, are you at a place in your life where you're saying, Lord, here I am. Use me. Listen, 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 listen. Listen. Don't try to be like nobody. Try to be you. 
understand that God loved you. He saved you. He shaped you. He cut you. Even some of those experiences that you had in your life and you didn't even understand what God was doing. God was molding and shaping your life all the time getting you ready for the unique ministry that he has called you to do to unlock the doors and the purposes in somebody else's life that he called you to. It ain't nobody else can do it but you and you gotta be willing to rise up and say here am I Lord well give it all is there anybody willing is there anybody, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about a will, willing to serve, willing. And, 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 and see, when you understand your uniqueness, uh -huh. then there's got to be a willingness. In other words, you will not be sitting on somebody to wait and beg you to do what God doesn't call you to do. Somebody said, well, ain't nobody asked me. You done been cut. You done been shaped. Yeah. Ain't nobody have to give you no license to fulfill what you done been shaped and called to do. See, sometimes you, when, when folks get in a church and they see a ministry or something that is being undone, rather than saying, you know what, I just wish our church would do this. <laughs> well, I think we ought to have something going on for the young girls. Come on, come on. Well, I think we ought to be reaching out more to the single mothers. Well, why did God put that on your heart? You ain't no mean to empower you. God done cut you and shaped you and molded you and put something in you. Oh, God. Oh, my God. You don't need me to give you permission to do and to perform and to fulfill how God shaped you and cut you. Should touch somebody and say, You are a minister. You have a ministry. God doesn't shape you. Now, 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 listen. I know that everybody is not called to stand in the pulpit, everybody is not called to grab a mic on Sunday morning. But you're still a minister, and you've been cut to unlock some door. I, oh, my God. Go, go to Colossians 4 and, and, and 12. There's, I want to introduce you to, to one, one guy, one of my favorite guys in the scripture. L look at this guy. Epaphras. Uh, uh, Epaphras, or uh, Epaphras, if you prefer. Epaphras. <laughs> yes, yes. Who is one of you? What? Look at this guy. Look at how the Apostle Paul described him. He didn't say he had a Ph.D., he didn't say he was the president of the a AKAs. He didn't say Epaphras, the CEO of a Fortune 500 company. He says simply, Epaphras, one of you. One of you. Such somebody say he was, he was one of us. Amen. Wasn't no cute dog. Amen. He was just one of you. What, what, what if the whole church just said, I ain't trying to be all that. I'm just trying to be one of you. I'm just trying to be one of us. Yes. And, 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 and that's the attitude that this guy had. He was just one of them. And, and read on. A servant of Christ. He was one. And then he says, he was a servant of Christ. No record that he preached a message. No record that he started a church, led a ministry, but he was just one of us, a servant of Jesus Christ. What did he do? He salutes you. He sends you greetings. And what? Always laboring. Here's what this guy did. Here's how he served Christ. Always laboring. How? Fervently. Fervently. Uh-huh. For you in prayers. 
that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Here's a guy who was concerned about the development of other people. He was this guy in the church. He wasn't trying to just be nobody. All of that. But he was a guy that wanted to see Christians grow and develop. So he labored fervently in prayer. He would have been the guy on that five o'clock prayer team in the morning. That when nobody's looking and nobody's giving accolades, nobody, come on, they ain't having no appreciation for this guy. His, his, his labor is not on Sunday morning. But what he did was, was, was he would be the one, God Almighty, that wouldn't teach the class and lead the charge, but he would pray and labor. Because how many of you know that sometimes what we see, what we celebrate, is the one that's out front, the one that's got the mic, the one that's visible. But then the one that's behind the scene, that's laboring in prayer, that's Amen. praying, Lord, Amen. Lord, give us development. Help these that are weak to grow in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Amen. This is the kind of servants, the willing servants, somebody that is willing to be lost in themselves just to labor. Oh, amen. What if the church had ten epaphrases? God Almighty. That are just labor and prayer. Don't have to know your name. Don't ever have to celebrate. Labor. You pray for your preacher. You pray for the church and the salvation of others. Talking about a willing servant. I, 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 got, I got to get through. I haven't been talking a long time. Listen. There's got to be this attitude of willingness to serve. And then let me just try to quickly give you two more. I don't have time to do them justice, but. Uh, there's another spiritual, proper, spiritual attitude that we ought to have, and that is joy. Somebody say joy. 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 What is joy? It's outward exuberance. It, it, it's, it's, it's the respond of the heart and the soul and the mind of a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. There's a joy, difference in joy and happiness. A lot of times, happiness come and go based on the circumstances around it. But joy comes from the inside in knowing who Jesus is. That's why Paul said in Philippians 4, 4, rejoice always. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. I, I, I believe, listen, if I can hasten and say, I believe that joy is, is, is intimately linked to the willingness to serve. Why you say that, Pastor? Because when people get involved in serving and, and fulfilling the gift that God has given them, if they, if they get in, 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 in involved in, 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 in unlocking doors in their lives being an instrument of grace in the life of somebody else, sometimes even if you got a problem, Joy and celebration can come into your life. There's a lot of miserable people because they are too introspective. They are only, come on, amen. Uh, um, uh, what you say, Elder Patrick? Uh, it's about me, my four, and no more. <laughs> But see, when you, when you allow yourself to be used by God and say, I am a servant for the good of the cause, I want God to use my life for, for something greater than me. Oh, come on, somebody. You're talking about a joy that money cannot buy. Do I have a witness here? But you want to see miserable people. Uh, generally, miser you know, people who have no joy in their life are not people who serve. They're not giving. They're not fulfilling God's purpose. They're not being you. But, but, you know, they, every, they see everything based on through their own lens. Amen? Amen. They're ingrown. And they're self-contemplating. and Miserable human beings. Amen. Because they, they don't give. They don't serve. And if I can candidly say, I don't believe that you will ever have joy. In your life, it doesn't matter how many toys you buy, how, many, how much stuff you accumulate, you will never have real joy in your life until you begin to fulfill God's purpose 
and willingly serve him to the glory of God. Why do you think that there is unfortunately so many people with riches taking their own lives, proving and demonstrating that money don't bring joy? Stuff don't bring joy. People don't. Some, some people are confused to think, oh, if I had this person in my life. Listen, don't you be waiting on nobody else. Your life, your, your joy is not predicated upon who is and who isn't in your life. Don't you empower nobody over you like that. The joy is knowing that you are who you are and where you are in God, independent of any other individual. If you walk out of my life, come on somebody, it doesn't stop. Glory to God. You got to know that you are somebody. Just come on. Me and God alone is the majority. And I am somebody. You might not like me. You may not think nothing of me. But I know as long as I know how, who I am and glory to God, I know that his purpose is being fulfilled in my life. I got joy that flows from on the inside. And I refuse to let anybody take my joy away. I heard somebody say it this morning, this joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. Come on, y'all know we used to sing that on Sunday morning, and the world can't take it away. Anybody got that joy? Anybody? Come on. What? Mighty. Why? 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 Why are you letting other people steal the joy out of your life? Together, lovely by yourself. Yes. God Almighty. And what God is doing in you and the joy and the fulfillment in your life, God Almighty, you ought to lift your head. Come on, come on. Oh, I wish I had some time here. Come on, you ought to lift your You got to learn how to celebrate yourself. You got to, come on, I'm not talking about being stuck up. I'm talking about being confident in knowing, amen, that I am who I am because of the Lord. Do I have a witness here? And, and, and wherever I am and whatever is going on in my life, it's all about him and to his glory. Shared a verse in this morning service, amen, Romans eleven thirty six. just kind of, you know what, it just hit my mind this week. He said, for all things, somebody say all things. All things are of him and through him and for him and to his glory. Do I have a witness here? All things are, come on somebody, you want to talk about ain't nobody can steal your joy? You want to know how to maintain your joy? I'm talking about the joy in your life when you can wrap your mind around the thing that God is. The source from which all things flow, he is the first cause. He is the alpha. He is the omega. Come on, somebody. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning and the end. He is the first and the last. And so if God allowed it, I can rejoice because the same one that is the first cause is the power through which it will be performed. So all things are of him and through him, through him. If I'm going to do anything worthwhile, it's through him. If I'm going to preach, it's through him. If I'm going to sing, it's through him. If I'm going to succeed, it's through him. So I rejoice because I live in him. I live, I move, I have my being. So it's of him and through him and then for him. Oh my God. So it's for his glory. And even when I can't see it and don't understand that, if he's taking me through it, it's for his purpose and for his glory. So I give him joy. And on the other side of it, it might hurt me, but God, God, oh my God, it's for his glory. And so I won't let people steal my joy. I, my God, hallelujah. I said it last week and I was in New York. When people who, 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 who you love hurt you, you got to learn to cry a river, build a bridge, and then get over it. Hallelujah. 
When they hurt you, go ahead and cry your river. Come on, it's all right to cry. And I might cry. You might hurt me, but I'm not going to get stuck there. I'll build me a bridge, and I'll get over it and declare that the joy of the Lord is my strength. Hey, God. Hey, hey. Anybody got joy? Come on, you do. Is anybody determined? I'm not going to let nobody, nothing and nobody steal my joy. If I'm hurting, I got joy. If I'm broke as a skunk, I got joy. Come on, somebody. If folks walk off and leave me, I still got joy. Because the joy of the Lord is my strength. Come on, y'all stand up. I was going to say some more, but I done preached too long already. Come on, give him praise. Come on, come on. Come on, give him a praise. I'm going to just quit. I'm not through, but come on, give him a praise right there. Come on, anybody got joy? You ought to shout life flow. Come on. Everyone standing in the presence of the Lord. And what I'm talking about, amen, amen. I'm talking about we ought to be in that place as an individual and as a body where the life of God is flowing, 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 flowing through our lives. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I, I heard, heard of a, 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 an undertaker who um, described um, that when they receive a corpse or a body that has died most of those bodies still have some semblance of life um, the, the, the nails still grow and, and, the, and the hair still grow um some undertakers have reported that sometimes eyelashes still blink. Sometimes there's still uh, a spontaneous spasming of, of, of muscles there. Sometimes some bodies will still quiver. You all heard the stories of, of, of a body sitting up. And then I, I believe that if we was back in the room and, and you back in there and you know it's been pronounced dead and, and all of a sudden that bad boy set up is somebody getting out of there. Amen. <laughs> but the undertaker was asked, well, 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 how is it that you handle that? How do you deal with a qu quivering? body how, how, how do you deal you know it's dead you, you done been called to pick up the corpse and, and how, how do you handle the, 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 the quivers and, and, and amen he said because I know what's dead is dead because even though it may quiver if it don't have any life flow The quivering don't bring it alive. I don't want to be in a church that just quivers. There's a lot of churches. They, 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 they jump. They quiver. They flash. They blink. They blink and they come on. And, 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 and it looked like, it looks like it's alive. But if the life flow, if the proper spiritual attitudes are not in that church, I don't care what it looked like or what semblance of life that it may have, it's still dead and twice dead. But I declare in the name of Jesus, 
If we can continue to yield ourselves to the word of God and say, Lord, what we want is you to cultivate proper spiritual attitude where we will be a church of obedience. Thank you, Jesus. And of humility and unity. And where folks are willing to serve. Where folks got the joy of the Lord. I'm just happy, happy, happy. People happy when they get new cars. And happy over money. Happy over stuff. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about when, when you're going through and yet your faith in God can cause you to lift your hands and say hallelujah anyhow. The joy of the Lord. Come on all over this room. Would you just slip up those hands? Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Say with me, Lord. We declare and decree that the life of Jesus will flow through this church. We declare in Jesus' name that the life of Jesus Christ will flow through my life. We call forth proper spiritual attitudes and attitudes of obedience, attitudes of humility, attitudes of unity, a willingness to serve. We call forth joy in Jesus' name. Father, now I pray over this body. I pray and I thank you for your word. I thank you for the opportunity to once again speak to these, your precious people. We ask, God, that you forgive us, Lord. There have been times, Lord, that we've come and we've had a semblance of life. God, we know that you are not impressed at all with us having just the form of it without the proper spiritual attitudes. May our preaching, not only my preaching, but all of these preachers, teachers, deacons, leaders, that we all understand that we are on this journey to cultivate, to teach, proper spiritual attitudes in order that the life of Jesus might flow and father we know that when those attitudes are demonstrated when we have that proper life flow we don't have to worry about whether this church will grow whether people will come whether our resource challenges will be met we know that they'll be met we know oh God that lives will be restored we know that, Lord Jesus, that every ministry, hallelujah, every program, every need will be fulfilled. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. I come against every spirit that's not your spirit. I renounce every attitude that's not yours. I rebuke and bind it in the name of Jesus. I declare that it does not belong in the body of Christ and it does not belong in this house. I renounce it and refute it in Jesus' name. And Lord, today we ask your blessings and ask that you forgive us if we've been part of or party to any attitude or spirit that's not yours. Have your way in our lives. And oh God, we, we ask and declare that every ministry, every minister will be mobilized and deputized and about your business. Have your way right now give you the praise and give the glory and the honor in Jesus name amen now every head is bowed every head is bowed and every eye is closed perhaps there's someone today in this room you're not saved you have not surrendered your life to the Lord and you know that if you will die right now you know that you'll be lost. Or maybe some of you are just unsure. You know, you know you've not made that step toward him. And you're saying, Pastor, I 
want to be saved. I want God to use my life. I know I've been through some things. I know I've made some mistakes, but I believe he have me here for a reason. And my answer is yes. I want to come to him. I want a relationship that I know that I know that I know him for myself. If that's you, man, man and woman, if that's you, whoever it is, and you're saying, pray for me, I'm ready to step toward God. I want him to change my life. If that's you, would you just slip up your hand right now? If you're, if you're here and you're saying, I want God to use my life, I see your hand. I see your hand. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Every head is yet bowed. There's somebody in this room. You know about God. In fact, you had stepped toward him, but, but, but for whatever reason, you've kind of slid back from your commitment. You know that you are not in the place where you ought to be. Your relationship, you, you, feel, you, you can feel and sense that gap between you and God in the presence of God, and you want it back. You want restoration in your life. You want him to redeem your life, and you're saying, pray for me. I want to get closer to God. I want to be all that he wants me to be. If that's you, would you slip up your hand? If, if that's you, you say, I want to get closer. I want him to restore my life. I see your hand. I see your Thank you, Jesus. 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 Maybe there's somebody in this room that you, that's just something. Thank you, Jesus. You need to give to God. You got a habit that you're struggling with. You got an issue that you got, you, 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 you. Thank you, Jesus. You got something you need God to do. You're tired of struggling with it. You want to give it to him. And you want special prayer. If those of you that raise your hand saying, I need salvation, I, I, I need restoration, or if you're saying, I need special prayer, I want all of you right now, without hesitation, I want you to walk from behind your seats. I want you to come and just stand with me. I'm not going to put you on the spot. I'm not going to put you out there. I just want to pray with you and for you. Start walking right now. Would you come and let me pray for you? If you need something from God, come right now. Come right now. Without hesitation, come right now. Send him that I live, move and have my 